Uh, we're going to talk about the instability in uh, South Asia, the instability in Afghanistan, uh, and really focus on whether we have mastered the art of making the same mistake over and over again. Um, you know, if you sit in Washington or if you, or if you uh, sit in Islamabad, that's probably the norm of your life. Um, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, let me uh, quickly introduce our very distinguished panel. And what we've decided is that we're going to make this a conversation <coughs> rather than a, a panel it, as such. We'll have very brief comments uh, from our panelists to begin with. Uh, we'll start a conversation, and I would really encourage all of you to jump in. There are mics that will come to you uh, if you raise your hand. Um, <coughs> no particular order. We won't wait till the end. I'll get some questions. We'll come back, and, and we'll, <coughs> we'll make it a real conversation, hopefully. So uh, from my uh, left on, uh, Kathy Gannon uh, is with the Associated Press, uh, has been a correspondent and bureau chief um, in Afghanistan, and also covers Pakistan since 1988. Um, her book, uh, I is for Infidel, if you haven't read it, it is one of the best contemporary <coughs> accounts of Afghanistan uh, over the past three decades or so. And Kathy has seen sort of the best and worst uh, of Afghanistan was also, um, you know, hurt in a terrorist attack in 2014, um, uh, which was a very unfortunate incident. Um, Mr. Zaid Hussain, an award-winning journalist, a writer, has uh, two very important books to his name, has worked for a number of uh, newspaper print outlets that um, I'd, I could spend the next half an hour going over. Uh, but somebody who actually has a very keen eye uh, on Afghanistan, has traveled extensively, uh, even during the, the Taliban years, and so we'll ask him how he thinks the, the region is shaping up. And last but not least, uh, Barney Rubin, uh, somebody who I've had the pleasure to associate with over the years, uh, is based at uh, New York University, um, is an author, worked for the U.S. State Department uh, uh, with Ambassador Holbrook, who was the special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, and is also uh, somebody who's uh, negotiated with the Taliban or open channels with the Taliban when he was in government, and recently also uh, wrote an open letter to the Taliban that got a very interesting response. So um, with that, let me ask Barney, Kathy, and Zaid. That's the order uh, we had decided to say a few words uh, initially, and then we'll have a conversation around that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, in addition, just one more word about myself. Of course, I'm also a character in the book, so I have a, a, a particular <coughs> perspective on it. But the main thing I want to say about Steve's book uh, which it will not necessarily be the focus of our discussion, is that the title is completely misleading <laughs> about the subject of the book. Barney, <laughs> sorry, can I just, for, for the benefit of the audience, this is Steve Cole's book, Directorate S. Steve Cole is also the author of the book Ghost Wars, uh, from where the title for the panel comes, that looked at the 1980s and onwards, the war in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and then this book looks at the post 9-11 uh, Afghanistan conundrum, U.S.-Pakistan relationship. But as Barney says, the book is really talking about the U.S. side of this, except that the title, I think, is, is the seller, which is directed as pointing to uh, the ISI. Barney. Well, I'm, I'm not. I suppose if it gives the impression it's a mystery novel or something, but I, I, I don't know if the mass market is aware of what director at S is. But uh, in, in any case, it sounds, you know, enticing. Um, at any rate, you will find in... Steve's book, some very well-sourced and well-documented things about uh, how the ISI op uh, has operated uh, in Afghanistan, why it has done so, and so on. However, you won't get to those things unless you pl pl plow through about 700 pages about all the mistakes the United States has made, um, and uh, uh, of various sorts, from one administration to another. And the book is over 700 pages, and with great difficulty, he cut out uh, about 200 or 300 other pages, including Melia, one of our conversations, which would have been really <laughs> an excellent story, but I won't tell it here. I won't let you report that here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just say that, um, well, I just want to read you something a little bit, because it, it's, a, it's an excerpt where Steve talks about Directorate S, but I, I think it's important to know the con to understand the context. I didn't figure, I didn't calculate how long it would take to read this. I don't think it's very long. It's maybe less than one page. 
As he began sitting in on national security meetings, presided over by Bush, that's President George W. Bush, or more often National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley, Lavoie, that's Peter Lavoie, who at that time was the National Intelligence Officer for South Asia, felt duty-bound to brief the material provided by the intelligence bureaucracy. <clears throat> but he could tell how frustrated cabinet members and deputies were with a lot of these prepackaged briefs and PowerPoints. They seemed loaded with a lot of information, but did not provide a lot of insight. Hardly anyone among the secretaries or deputy secretaries managing policy had long direct experience with Pakistan. This is, this is a chapter about the rise of domestic terrorism in Pakistan, in particular from the, starting from like the murder of Benazir Bhutto and going for a couple years after that. They might have gotten to know their counterparts in the Pakistan army or the foreign ministry and formed a few impressions from these relationships and their reading. Yet their responsibilities at state, the Pentagon, or the CIA spanned the world. And it was impossible for most of them to untangle complexities within complexities involving the wazirs, the masoods, or the structure of the Afghan Taliban's revival. Principals and deputies in Washington tended to reach a judgment, quote, ISI is the problem, unquote, for example, because of the operations of Directorate S, and then never changed their minds. It wasn't as if such a judgment lacked a factual basis. The problem was that it did not account for what had become, <coughs> in 2007, a, a very dynamic situation. That is one third of the way from 2001 to where we are now. Uh, the birth of a serious violent domestic rebellion against the Pakistani state carried out by some of the Islamist forces the state had long nurtured. Then he goes on a little bit about director S. But I think the, the point that we get here <coughs> is that um, you know, yes, Pakistan has been involved in uh, what, for want of a better word, I will say is supporting the Taliban. But in the overall picture, I have to say, it does not, uh, Steve's book does not support the thesis that we hear sometimes that sanctuary in Pakistan and support with Pakistan from outside is the main problem. Uh, the main problem is something that is touched on in that one sentence, which is that uh, and I hardly even mean this as a criticism, but just an acknowledgement of an inevitable <clears throat> fact. The United States is not capable of really understanding the situation that it has gotten itself into in, in that region. And there's no way that you could expect it to. Uh, one time, an example, uh, in 2008, again, a long time ago, just at the end of the Bush administration, when uh, I was <clears throat> near the end of the Bush administration, I was allowed into the offices again when they were doing their evaluations. And I was talking to uh, Doug Lute, who was then the, the so-called war czar for Iraq and Afghanistan. And he, was, and he had just presided over this evaluation of uh, the war policy. And they discovered they were fighting 10 wars, not coordinated with each other. And, uh, so, and I'll tell you one anecdote that he told me. They, they did, this is the famous Lute review. And they presented it to the uh, not to the Principals Committee, which is to say the National Security Council, but chaired by the National Security Advisor. Um, Condoleezza Rice had insisted that they put on the front of it uh, a one-page statistical comparison of Afghanistan and Iraq. And he said they spent much of the meeting discussing something that the people at that meeting were, were learning for the first time, how much poorer Afghanistan was than Iraq. Uh, so and th this was you know, after the, at the end of the Bush administration. So okay. the one point he said to overcome some of their ignorance, they had developed an online data system. Don't worry, this is reasonably interesting. <laughs> they developed an online data system uh, about all the tribes and groups in Afghanistan so that wherever a military unit was deployed, they could log on to that system and find out you know, who was in the environment or what they were doing. And I said to him, if we have a strategy that requires our military units deployed on the ground to understand Afghan tribal politics, that we have a strategy that is going to fail. Marnie, that's actually an interesting segue, and, and thank you for that, because I know, Kathy, you focus so much on Afghanistan internally. And, you know, there's tons of conversation about the region, Pakistan, Steve's book. Um, but Afghanistan internally uh, has been a country that's been in turmoil for four decades now. Sure. Um, I guess what I'd like to, I'd like to say, because I, I, um, I've been spending a lot of time in Afghanistan, and a lot of time recently, actually, I've been spending in Afghanistan since coming back after this. Um, and I think, for me, um, uh, 
a big, big part of the problem is the narrative has been set in Washington and the responses to the Washington narrative. And they, the, the, these people involved in Afghanistan are very much talking to leaderships, to themselves, to each other, and, and not very much with Afghans themselves. And the problems in Afghanistan, um, they began right from the post-2001. And this about, does history repeat itself? <clears throat> My goodness, it's just, I, you, you just wonder. I mean, the Bonn Agreement, it, you couldn't have had a worse agreement if you wanted to see Afghanistan end where it was today. That was a given right from the very beginning. And then the unity government. I mean, did nobody know what had gone on in Afghanistan before? 1992 they came in. They went to Mecca first, swore on the Quran, they'd get along, you'd get this ministry, you'd have that ministry. They immediately got into Afghanistan and started killing each other. You then put together a unity government from Washington. And, and I guess what has really been a bit of a heartbreaker for me to watch over and over again is how <coughs> Afghans are ignored. Afghans know what's going on in their country. And just one thing, because I don't have as, as much to say as everybody, but one thing that is really heartbreaking, I find, is I've got friends who have nothing to do with uh, uh, governments and nothing to do with who have been there during Najib, they've been there during the uh, Mujahideen, they've been there during the Taliban, they've been there post, they are sending their families out. I had a friend of mine, he called me. He says, you know, somebody has said that he, he'll, he'll move two of my sons and for $10,000, he'll take them to Turkey and then go on. I said, please don't do that, please, because you don't know how they're going to, what's going to happen to them. <clears throat> and for me, this speaks volumes about Afghanistan, and it speaks volumes about the approach that has been taken to Afghanistan. And, and currently now, you know, and I'll just say this really quickly, is people say, you know, if everybody pulls out, if all the foreign troops pull out the Taliban, who knows what's going to happen vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. In my mind, having spent quite a bit of time, the divisions have become, ethnic divisions have become so deep and so strong in Afghanistan today. The problem that <laughs> I see, and what do I know, but I see is that, that if, if everybody left, the problem isn't that the Taliban will take over tomorrow. The Taliban have their own issues, and I know a lot about those, but the, the, ethnic, the, the civil war, the ethnic divisions, people will start. The, the, the warlords that were brought back in that nobody wanted, but of course the, the West knew nobody but them. They've been disengaged with the Taliban during the Taliban years, so they brought all the same people back. And then later they say, what? Look at that, they're, they're not getting along. I mean, really? So, so anyway, so that's in a nutshell. I, I just think it's very important to bring, the, to, to, to find the narrative in Afghanistan and talk to Afghanistans to try to figure out how do you move forward. And it's very complicated. The region, of course, Russia's involved, Iran's involved, Pakistan, of course, is involved. And so off to Zahid, um, who knows much more. So, <laughs> if I may, um, put two specific questions to you, and you can frame your remarks around that. Uh, one, I think there is a concern in Pakistan on the street when I have conversations, that are we headed to another 80s moment here, where the spillover uh, is going to increase, not decrease, from Afghanistan if things go the way uh, Kathy, Kathy has mentioned. The second question is relate, relaying my own experience for the past, I would say, six, eight months. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship hit a new low uh, this week with both sides essentially, as if that was possible, um, both sides um, essentially putting restrictions on their diplomats uh, who can't go beyond 25 miles in, in Washington, and I don't know what the, what the figure is in, um, on, on the Pakistani side, but in any case, it's, it's gotten to that level. The question I have for you is, the, the official meetings take place very regularly. Uh, somebody flies from Washington or from Islamabad. Uh, both come out saying we've agreed to something in terms of where we go. I hear a readout from both sides. Both say, yes, we've agreed to X, and there's no problem with that. And then I ask them what X is, and their understanding of what they agreed to do is polar opposite. Yeah. Um, both sides, a month later, blame each other for being you know, deceitful and liars and whatever. What is going on? Well, that's a... Uh, hundred million dollar question, what's going on? I'll take the um, money if you can. <laughs> so let, let me start from this, uh, the topic which is there. Has any lesson been learned from, and that, and I'll go to your uh, question. I think uh, not only that, no lesson has been learned, worse mistakes have been made. By whom? By 
uh, I will say it because largely is American war in Afghanistan. So basically, it's, uh, when Americans uh, went into Afghanistan, uh, did they know actually what, what's uh, the long-term strategy? And that's basically, uh, that's a major problem. Uh, when we're talking about 1980s, because um, everything, uh, I would not say there's a, continu a continuation of that, but certainly directly linked what, uh, throughout whatever happened last uh, four decades. Well, actually, when, uh, when the uh, 1980s, war against uh, or resistance against Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, I would say that even at that point, there was certainly a convergence of interests to some extent between Pakistan and the United States. But little extent, but both of them have a different uh, goal altogether. Number one, actually, the Americans wanted only uh, the Soviet forces to be out in Afghanistan, or defeated rather. And for Pakistan, it was basically a matter that Soviet uh, uh, forces were on, on the borders. So they fought each other, and obviously, soon after, uh, you know, they went on to a different direction. 1990s, uh, sorry, 2001, it was a completely different situation. It was um, uh, not that convergence of interest, but larger as it has been called a shotgun marriage. And that shotgun marriage uh, will never have to last long. Um, uh, and I think probably um, I was going through this uh, book, Directorate S. My also, I was very curious to understand what the Directorate S is all about. And I really wanted to know about it. And to my disappointment as yours, that I could fi hardly find anything actually worth uh, understanding that. Uh, Steve Phenomenal. is not here, so we leave that for another, uh, another yes. day. But, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> but I think from here, I, I will give you, uh, just to understand a little bit, uh, I'll quote another book, uh, which was written by a CIA, a former CIA um, station chief in Pakistan, Robert Bob Grenier. Grenier. And I think probably it's much more profound book than uh, just to understanding at what's really happening today in Afghanistan when you ask actually what, that actually gives you a little bit of understanding, or much more understanding. What he says actually that um, there were, Americans have already fought two wars in Afghanistan. One is started soon after 9-11, and to some extent they can claim that it, they have won that war because uh, it had achieved objective sure. to a certain extent. Taliban, Taliban government was overthrown, Al-Qaeda was pushed out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But soon after 9, uh, 2004 or 2005, Americans got involved in Second Afghan War. And that is still continuing, and there's no winner. But worse is basically what he, uh, he's forecasting, and I think it is all coming now, is that Americans will soon get into a Third Afghan War. And with more troops surge in Afghanistan, that I think probably my, that forecast is coming true. And uh, so you, uh, so that's basically, uh, and one thing more actually, what he says, uh, is that the situation in Afghanistan today is worse than it was in 2001. So it, yeah. uh, whether one can agree it or not, but it is, if I have to get here, just say it about. It's what is basically my major concern, or everybody's concern in Pakistan when you're talking about, is that uh, we have already gone into 1990s situation. 19, uh, 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 when uh, this civil war in Afghanistan, if you go and if you see in Afghanistan, almost all the names are so familiar: Gulbadi Nekmatia, uh, Malik, uh, uh, Dostam, uh, name anyone actually, they are all there. So uh, it's a back to the square one. And I think, as far as Pakistan and, and United States relationship is concerned, it is basically it. It started on a, uh, on a basis of distrust from the very outset, very outset. Don't forget about the, exp uh, the experience or, uh, you know, uh, of 1990s, when Pakistan got involved or went into a second alliance with the United States. It was there, the burden of history of 1990s. So in a way, actually, uh, when, yes, actually, Pakistan may be blamed for many things, but when you hear this narrative, it's all, but basically look at what's really happened. Did the United States know what uh, the war is going to be? It started in 2004, uh, George W. Bush. He announced that uh, Taliban have been defeated. It was not, and that was just the beginning of Second Afghan War. And today, too, actually, uh, does America have any strategy? 
nobody knows actually. And I okay. think probably in Washington too, ask anyone. And I think probably they will be built right. And it's already 17 years long. Thankfully, I'm only the moderator today. I won't <coughs> answer that. Barney, uh, <coughs> did you want to sort of come in on the conversation? Well, about? I can say so many. But first, I just want to step back a little bit. <coughs> I think it's very misleading to talk about people making mistakes. It implies that there's a right way to do things that would have worked, yeah. which is not true. There are better ways, yeah. so There were better I, ways. I don't, I don't think we know that. It could be worse. <laughs> it's a counterfactual. Um, when we say things are better or worse today than in 2001, I don't think that's meaningful. There's le- uh, the, 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 security, Afghans, the security in Kabul today is much worse than it was in 2001. The level of education in Kabul and healthcare is much higher than it was in 2001. If you ask Afghans, it's much worse. If you ask, uh, 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 I, 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 if you ask people there to give a yes or no answer to a question, you will get a simple answer. But the fact is, his, just what it said, that history is dynamic. There are many different uh, things going on. Look, I spent the last 17 years criticizing what the United States and many other people, including Pakistan and others, are doing in Afghanistan. So uh, I'm not naive, you know, and I don't have a rosy colored picture of it. But I also spent time trying to fix that in, in the government. And I tried to fix it in the UN. You say the bond agreement was such a terrible agreement. Well, but you know what was good about it? It was an agreement. There was no other agreement you could get at that time with the people that were on the ground. You, and First, finally, the re- fa- things that are going on in Afghanistan now are the result of huge amounts of international resources being devoted to it. Are this being de- uh, devoted wrong way, right way? I'll tell you one thing. They're not being devoted to it for the sake of Afghanistan. The, and that's not a criticism. That is a fact about international politics. The United States does not spend $100 billion a year on anything because it's concerned about 30 very poor people in the middle of, of a landlocked country. In Asia. It did it because we were attacked. One of the virtues of this book, and of the fact that it focuses on the CIA, is it keeps that front and center. And it points out how parts of the war and the effort that we are most likely to be aware of are the least important parts. Because whenever there was a conflict between what the United States conceived of (coughs) as the counterterrorism effort, focused then on Al-Qaeda, now on Al-Qaeda, and to some extent on the Islamic State, and those other efforts, the counterterrorism effort won. You can find many uh, ex- examples of that in here. And it's not because they made a mistake about what is best for <laughs> Afghanistan or they made a mistake about how to bring peace to Afghanistan. It's because the United States doesn't have much interest in bringing peace to Afghanistan. It had an interest in fighting against the terrorists who attacked the United States, and that's what they were doing. Or are they doing it the best possible way? No. Now, let me just say one thing about that we haven't looked at, which is the world, we're not going back to the 1990s or the 1980s, which doesn't mean we're going to something better, but we're going to something different. Sure. Because let me just mention something that happened uh, a week or two ago. The Prime Minister of India and the President of China met at a summit in Wuhan for several days of private talks. One of the results of that summit was an agreement uh, in principle between those two countries to cooperate on development projects in Afghanistan. What I understand from my Chinese colleagues and what I've been hearing from others as well is that one of their major ideas is to work together on building a rail link from Western China through Central Asia, which is now, because of the changes in Uzbekistan, much more open, through Northern Afghanistan, into Iran, and out through the port of Chabahar, taking place in the context of the Chinese Belt and Road initiative, which is the largest infrastructure project in the history of the world, the Indian, Afghan, Iranian efforts in Chabahar, and many other such infrastructure projects. All right, this, and, this, and where India and China have consistently uh, much bigger growth rates than countries in the West. So the region is quite changing. India and China might be, I mean, part of the reason for doing this is that, of course, everyone knows India and China, they're not best friends, you know, Hindi, Chini, Bye Bye, et cetera. And <laughs> cynics, like, cynics likes to put, point that out, but I've got an interesting point for you, which is that that's very irrelevant in international politics. What is relevant is that India and China, have, despite their conflicts, have identified certain common interests that they have, sure. which is that they do not want violent conflict disrupting the regional aspects of their economic growth. And what China did with respect to North Korea could be a foreshadowing of what sometime it will feel it has to do with Pakistan. Kathy, you wanted to come in on... on Well, you know, I mean, 
I, I think the irrelevance of international politics is, is, is evident in Afghanistan, I think, because if you look at the situation today in Afghanistan, and, and I think in some ways it's a disservice to Afghans when things like, well, you know, it was the best solution at the time. It wasn't an Afghan solution. It was a solution that was imposed. Um, that, that basically says to Afghans that these were the people and the only people that could rule you um, because those are the ones that we were allied with. The uh, unity government, again. Um, now, I, Afghans themselves know much better than us sitting here, any of us sitting here, know much better the, the realities on the ground and how to move forward. But very rarely uh, do people who are making policy, who are imposing policy, who are developing policy, they um, come and go, they, they, um, they talk to leaders, uh, Afghan leaders. Um, to me, I think what I have noticed the most, and right from the outset, um, after the Bonn Agreement, when I was there, and I was there, um, because the Taliban let me back in for the last three weeks of the bombing. So I was there during the bombing, and I was, you know, talking to people, because I obviously had, had uh, been there throughout the Taliban. And once the, the um, uh, bond agreement came and, and the Taliban left, there was a real understanding of who the people were that they had been, had been chosen. Mm -hmm. and, and the foolishness of it, frankly, um, in, in an ethnic a sense. You had an Uzbek, Dostum, with a militia. You had a Tajik, Fahim, with a militia. You had a, um, a Hazara, a Mohakik, with militia. And Hamid Karzai, a Pashtun, with no one. And you said to everybody, well, listen, what do you think? And everybody says, no, Kathy, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Everybody accepted Hamid Karzai because he has no blood on his hand. And I thought, really? They accepted Hamid Karzai because he was weak. And they perceived him as weak, so that gave them strength. But every Afghans, when you talk to them, they thought, okay, the international community, they're, they, surely they're not stupid. They will make sure that these people don't go back to what they had. Because we are within, within, immediately. So people say that, that, and I remember being down in Zermatt and out of the, the city and, and talking to <laughs> Afghans, and they said, we don't care. Send 50,000, 60,000 troops. Please do not send the Northern Alliance down to us. But, but they, that, that's what happened. Now, all I'm saying, I, there were 2,000 Pashtuns from Zabo went up to join the police. This is in 2002, early. All but four returned, left and, and went with the, the Taliban. So it was in 2004 that the Taliban regained strength. The Taliban, they all went home, uh, the vast majority, immediately after 2001. Within months, and there were people I knew, they were within months, they were going back into the hills. Within months, by the middle of 2002. So, so let, me, let me just... Um, I, told Razi my, I told Razi my job is to provoke this panel, but I don't think no, I need no, any... You <laughs> guys don't need any provocation here. Um, so, yeah, let, me, let me, before, before you come into this, um, I do want to switch a little bit to what to do. Uh, I think it's easy to point fingers. It's, it's yeah. you know, behind us in some ways. Could I ask we you know to modify the, that question? Sorry? What should, who? Yeah, who? I'm, I'm yeah. going to get to this. You know, the, the idea that mistakes were made, I think, is established. Perhaps you haven't learned much. Uh, the question mm. is, there are parties <laughs> that, that we can talk about. The U.S., Afghanistan, obviously the two big stakeholders, then the region. Pakistan is the key stakeholder there. Let's switch a little bit to talking about, from here on in the next two or three years, where do we go? What yeah. should wh which actor do to get us to a more stable Afghanistan, but quite frankly, region? Because we're also talking Pakistan here. Well, actually, at, uh, at one point, it is generally believed that um, uh, the solution of Afghan crisis lies, number one, actually, uh, uh, a political neg negotiations within. And the second is basically the regional participation. And I think two or three years ago, it seemed that uh, regional, there was some a bit of consensus among the regional power that the stability of Afghanistan is very important for the entire region. But now things have changed tremendously. Uh, that's why actually I'm saying it's going back to 1990s. Then it, it, I mean, most of the countries, neighboring countries now have a huge stake in Afghanistan, not actually in the, the, the peace as much, as just to have their area of influence, in, uh, uh, you know, to build that area of influence. Do you Pakistan in that? Well, Pakistan is always, be, like Pakistan is basically a part of Afghan crisis forever. I mean, like from 1980s, whatever is happening in Afghanistan, it has a spillover effect in Pakistan. 
and it will continue to show this. So Pakistan has always had a huge stake in Afghanistan, whether you can debate actually whether our policy was right or wrong, that's a totally different thing. But coming to the other regional countries, for example, Iran, for example, Iran has actually supported the United States tacitly. But now actually Iranians have developed their own interests. Now. It's not like they want to change the regime in, in Kabul, but certainly they want to in, strengthen their area of influence, whatever. Especially after the nuclear deal. Uh, and I then, yes, actually that is most dangerous now. What is actually now Taliban, for example, there's already many reports that Taliban leadership are basically now you know, shifting to, uh, to Iran. And that's, that's almost Mullah Mansur Akhtar sure. was coming from. So, but basically what I'm saying now, Russia, the, you, are, you have just actually uh, talked about uh, India and China. Yes, actually that has been a major development as a cooperation. But basically can, uh, can it uh, you know, uh, offer any solution to Afghanistan. Well, there can be understanding that, yes, they both have, uh, that have interest in development of Afghanistan, but, but it's a secondary issue at the moment because unless some kind of peace is restored, there's, uh, you can have several uh, you know, agreements. Other thing actually which people have forgotten about, Russian interest. Sure. is a huge actually because Russia is also very much concerned about the rise of Daesh in Afghanistan. And uh, Daesh in Afghanistan, which is basically on the, the, on the northern yeah. Afghanistan. 1,500. 50. Exactly. And first thing, I think that what is much more uh, alarming is that some of the area in Afghanistan where the, you, have, you seem to have a much peaceful area in northern, in northern Afghanistan, they had become actually a major center of insurgency. So what I'm feeling actually what should be done is basically if the United States does not have a clear policy direction, even if the regional countries get united, for example, there are so many processes are going yeah. now. So can they deliver peace? I doubt it very much because unless the United States is really interested in providing some kind of political solution. Now that I've been demuted de before I'm sabotaged again, let me sort of go to, to the audience and see if there are... Uh, is he still me? muted? May I have my... Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I have to say something here. Let's, uh, let's get the audience. Let's get a couple of questions. No, I, I'll have more questions. But, all right, all right, if you insist, go ahead. Um, the, the hand up there, the gentleman there. <coughs> the gentleman in the glasses. So my, uh, my question really is that listening to the, the discussion on this panel, it seems that history in Afghanistan, uh, or rather history as it relates to India and Pakistan, only begins in the 80s. Pakistan was left with an Afghan problem on the day of independence, we had a Durand line which had divided the Pakhtuns between India, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Our <coughs> problems begin then. And to say that uh, the world's most powerful country in the world with one of the most powerful intelligence agencies remained uh, ill-informed and ignorant since the 1950s when America had a base in, the, in, in Pakistan, how can we, how can we not say that we have not learned anything from history when America inherits the British colonialism and transforms it into imperialism. Okay. Um, thank you. So if everybody could make their questions short because we want to give the panelists a chance. All the way back, the lady at the back will take a couple and then, then come back. But let's make the questions short and the answers shorter, please. We have uh, four Afghan specialists sitting here. Can any one of you tell me how many American soldiers died in the Russian-American war. Um, question of history. Where is Professor Aisha Jalal? She's American going to be here in the evening. Um, okay, one more, right here in front. If we could, if there's a. Or you well, as, far as, as far as I know it, not even one American soldier died in the Russian and American <laughs> war. Okay. Okay. And then, and then. All the thugs and all the crooked people from around the Middle East and African countries were brought into Pakistan. And ISI today is like blamed, you see, like the most okay. pathetic uh, intelligence agency. They are the one who helped the Americans fight no. the Russians. And then the Russians left Afghanistan 
Americans sure. left all the ammunition. Ma'am, we really, we're let, gonna, me, uh, let me let me let me no, finish. There are others who need. To I know ask that. I know that. Let me finish. And then Americans left all the ammunition in Pakistan. Sure. And then Paki- and then the Pressler Amendment Sorry. came, and Pakistan was supposed to be declared a terrorist uh, Ma'am, you've uh, country. Only got ni- you've only got into I, I, One second. One more second. One more second, sir. And then at that time. We had Ambassador Maliha Lodi as an ambassador. She did the greatest job, okay? Now you can carry on. She did the greatest job. (laughs) She did the greatest job in preventing that Pakistan should okay. not be declared a terrorist society. Okay, ma'am, we this really need to... This is just a comment. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Last question. Thank you. A question, a question please. Absolutely. Just a question. question. Uh, the importance of India being in Afghanistan yeah. and actually Afghanistan being quite at the border yeah. of Pakistan and that the significance of Indian intervention, which is where Pakistan had to protect itself, and this sure. was just mentioned with China which has now gotten so involved with Pakistan, and that's actually been quite destabilizing to American interests in the area. Sure. I think the hope for peace going forward will be the Chinese as they make peace with <clears throat> India potentially and Pakistan so that the, okay. the fight for interest in that area. So I'm just curious about where do you see America negotiating this with the okay. Chinese so and India-Pakistan? Chinese role and um, incompetence of lack of information or understanding on the CIA's part uh, as history unfolded. Okay. So why don't we start with well, you and then come If you've back. ever been on an American base, you would know that being an American base does not provide you with a lot of insight around, about the surrounding country. And you can read that in the book, too. Um, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's absolutely true. Yes. yes. Now, um, look, I'm just going to say a very few theses, which I'm sure I will not even be able to make comprehensible to most people. But one, there's no such thing as Afghan solutions to Afghan problems because Afghanistan was not created by Afghans. The Afghanistan that exists today was created by the British and Russian colonial empires out of Afghan empires that had existed before. And it was created to be dependent, and it has always been dependent. Afghans could not decide on their own solution because Afghanistan by itself in its current state cannot afford a state. The Afghan state since, 18, uh, since the 1890s has always been ex- uh, supported from outside. The current situation, you know, and there are two uh, contradictory things that people say, and they're both true, which is Afghan, if American troops leave, then the current government will collapse and you will have no stability in Afghanistan. The other thing which is true is as long as American troops stay, people will fight them. The countries of the region uh, will try to make sure that they do not be comfortable there because they don't trust the intentions of the United States and they don't want to have permanent basis there. And therefore, you will never have stability. So the core question is, is there a political solution to the problem of a stable state in Afghanistan, both its security requirements and its financial requirements? Now, given the fact the United States right now is the most uh, uh, powerful country there, it's the predominant power, but it's not... 1945 anymore. It's not even 1989 anymore because of what the things that I mentioned about the rise of China and India, also Pakistan and Iran for that matter, Russia's resurgence and so on. And the United States, certainly under the current administration, and even to some extent under other administrations, does not have the equipment to deal with a world in which it is <clears throat> first among equals. But the reason I don't, ex- I, I think there are various things that we can, that various actors can do to prepare the way for greater stability in Afghanistan in the future. But while we have, uh, pardon me if this seems like a partisan statement, I believe it is a cold analytical fact. As long as we have the current administration in uh, the United States, there is no way that the United States can engage with all of Afghanistan's neighbors and the political actors in Afghanistan in such a way as to stabilize the region. You can't pick fights simultaneously with Pakistan, Iran, Russia, and China and also stabilize Afghanistan. (laughs) Um, um, China question. China as a peacemaker in the region. Um, You've got China-Pakistan, you've got China and India meeting, but at the same time, 
You've got an India-Pakistan tension. And one of the things I also want to put on the table here is I've just sort of finished this book looking at India-Pakistan and the U.S. role. Mm. That's changed over decades. Um, I talk to editors and newspapermen and, and sort of the TV anchors right now on the book. And the first thing they say is, but India-Pakistan is relatively peaceful. The game is North Korea and Iran right now. Clearly, nobody's looked at the line of control or Kashmir or, or everything that's happening there. Where does the China piece fit in the India-Pakistan piece? Because it, at least I'm captive to my own research. But one big conclusion I have in my book is that peace in South Asia is about India-Pakistan. You don't resolve that, you don't get peace, even in Afghanistan. Well, actually, as far as China is concerned, there's no doubt about that, that China's increasing uh, presence in the region and more active role. It's no more China of uh, about um, a decade ago where it will keep itself out completely from the conflict. And it has already shown it. China is a member of the quadrilateral yeah. uh, forum uh, between. So that means that even for America, China's role seems to be a little bit more important. Positive uh, or negative? Uh, uh, positive. I think at the moment positive. But I, uh, but I think there's also a limitation to that. Okay. Uh, one cannot expect China to come out with any you know, solution of Afghanistan problem. That's not actually. That can, they, if, if there's some process starts where the regional powers are, are, are involved, and if there is also can, some kind of understanding in the United States. Because look, actually, the final, whatever is going to happen in Afghanistan, it all depends on the United States. Because the United States is present there, so one cannot. There, there's always a talk about. Well, actually, let's regional countries unite and and try to find some solution. Sure. But basically, they can't. They can sure. facilitate peace in Afghanistan. They sure. can facilitate dialogue, but they cannot offer a, 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 a solution to that. The other thing that um, just Barney said about um, you know the Americans um, are not. Or there's no solution of one, as you said, like, no Afghan solution as such. Well. So I think probably, which means, which is much more a bleak picture, which means uh, are the, our American forces going to stay indefinitely there? Because um, uh, if there is no solution, then obviously we should also you know, say nothing can be done, actually. OK. So. Kathy, quickly? Yeah. Um, I like to say is that I think that, that to rely heavily on the US for a solution, granted the, the major power, absolutely. But I think if you look at the past 17 years, you see where the, 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 um, the danger of relying on the US as, as, uh, uh, for, for, for solutions, for direction, for strategy, or lack of. So I think, I think that it is a regional. I think it, it very much is a, a regional process. But I think there has to be some much, much better understanding of Afghanistan itself and what is going on inside Afghanistan. And try to better understand before you try to bring everybody around sure. to try to impose a solution or say, now here, we think we have the best answer for you. There isn't really, from anything I have seen or heard, a real solid understanding of what is going on. If I hear one more time, well, you know, better health care, better education, sure, security, no health. But the people are thinking that there's a real strong sense among people. Um, there's, a, there's an anger at all foreigners. There's an anger at, the, 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 at Pakistan. There's, there's a, a, a real disillusionment with their own government. There has to be a better understanding of what is going on inside Afghanistan and a real desire to understand. And then everybody comes together to try to figure out. I, that's, that's Let's get a couple more questions, come back, and then we will be out of time, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to get to everybody. The gentleman in the glasses here, uh, right here, yes. And then we'll go to the back there and one there, and then we'll come back to the panel and end this. Okay. A quick one, please. We okay. have to make it short. Uh, great discussion, by the way. Uh, just uh, looking at, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, technical things being discussed here. It seems like the elephant in the room that uh, we as observers have seen uh, over the last uh, decades is uh, there's a significant religious fundamental problem in that area. Nobody has even mentioned okay. as if that is an issue here in this okay. panel. No, thanks. Um, yes, the gentleman here, and then we'll take one from there and come back to the panel. So it seems like we're in a deadlock. Where do you think the push for change is going to come? Is it going to be more violence in Afghanistan? Is it going to be a change in American public opinion? Is it China stepping up? What's going to move this deadlock to become unsustainable? Okay. 
And back there, hopefully an equally short question. Can we get the mic back, please? <coughs> Thank you. This is going to be a quick question, and, and this is a very interesting discussion. And my question is that all three of you have different point of views as to um, what the U.S. involvement should be or, or whether, whether it's been productive or not. You have an Afghan point of view. You spend a lot of time there. My question is a country that spends hundreds of billions of dollars, sends tens of thousands of people there. There's one thing that you three agree on is that the U.S. strategy is wrong. So how is it that, that the most powerful country with tens of thousands of people in intelligence trying to figure out the solution to what we're discussing here, just there's one, the, probably the only thing you guys agree on is that the U.S. has got it wrong. Okay. So why does that happen? Thanks. Uh, down this way? Sure. Um, first, what, when does it become unsustainable? Only if it impacts uh, the, the, the West again. If there's another attack or something like that, it becomes unsustainable. The level of violence will, in, in my mind, the level of violence will increase. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure at what point it's, people say, it's already off the radar in so many, so many screens. So I think that's a, that's a thing. Um, why, why has the, the, the mistakes been so... Uh, uh, in my mind, and this is just in my mind, that they, they, the mistakes have continued and there's been, um, there's a level of arrogance, there's a level of, of, of really, you disengage with, with people and so um, there, there's an imposition of, of solutions. There's a, a, a belief that this is the way it is and so, um, I think anyway, and, 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 uh, and so, um, and, and it's imposed, and, and, and again, and I, I keep going back to this, and as there has to be an understanding of what is really going on inside of Af Afghanistan and among the people. And that doesn't say I'm not trying to play down the, the role of, of Pakistan or of Russia or of, or of Iran or of China, but I'm, I'm saying there is just has to be a much better understanding of what the people are, are, are going through, thinking, the... the, the if you're going to try to move forward with a solution and then you bring, what you do is you bring everybody, all these people in saying, yes, this is the problem, we should do this, we should do that, and then you, you impose it on, on, on the people without really understanding what were the big problems in the first place and when are they dissatisfied. Yeah, if you were to ask the audience you're talking about, if you could give a one-liner, as impossible as it is, what is their solution? Well, I mean, I, I think it's not, it's not that simple. I mean, I, but, but I think there has to be an understanding of what is going on inside the country, that level of despair, the level of, of, of uh, um, disillusionment, the level of hopelessness. Because for a lot of people, they've gone through four decades of war. When, when 2001 happened and the Taliban left, they were thrilled to see the back of the Taliban. They had hope. Maybe it was, was uh, uh, overextended, it was everything. But today, now these are people who have never left that country. Mostly you engage with people who've come post-2001, but I'm talking about people who never left this country. They were there during the G, mm. on and on and on. <coughs> the level of, of hopelessness is, is a real issue that has to be dealt with and, and, and it, or that, that is part of the, the problem. But anyway, I mean, it's not just one. I'm just saying that, that all the solutions come from outside, and, and I think as a result, you, you, it, it doesn't come up with a solution that is workable within the country. And people don't have a clue. I think there, there was a question about uh, what could be the push uh, which will compel the United States to have to, I think Afghanistan has been off the radar for quite some time. And it's just getting more and more remote. Um, and with the new development, uh, with the Iran nuclear, uh, Americans pulling out from an uh, Iranian nuclear a deal and then situation in the Middle East, and as you have just mentioned about uh, Korean Peninsula, trade war with, uh, uh, with China, all those factors are getting into it. So at this point of time, um, I was talking to a very senior ex-official, um, a U.S. official, and said, look actually in Washington, uh, Afghanistan is basically completely you know, um, uh, out of you know, table. After it, yeah. And so basically, uh, if it is the situation, then Afghans are left, uh, led uh, to their own. And what is basically much more worrisome, as I said earlier, is that uh, it is a civil war, isn't it? Like, for example, uh, I used to be in and out of Kabul, but I went after a very long time with Kathy being there. But what I witnessed last visit uh, and, uh, about two months ago, you know, uh, I've never seen that situation. 
security situation. And when um, and everywhere actually this post and this uncertainty, kind of uncertainty, and the, there is no realization about the uh, the uh, the insurgency has already taken a new dimension uh, with the rise of Daesh. Although people if say, okay, there's not a force with that, but basically most of the attack which has taken place in Kabul and they targeted the civilian, they are basically conducted by Daesh. Sure. So uh, well, actually, it means. As you asked me, the situation is getting worse and worse. More attacks are coming. Okay. <clears throat> Barney, give, um, give us some good news. It's <laughs> too late in the afternoon. Well, no, I, I, first, it's misleading to say, it's not wrong, but it's misleading to say <clears throat> that the United States has the wrong strategy. Because, it gives, because a strategy is relevant to an objective. Yeah. And it's very likely that, that, person, that those of you who are saying that do not have in mind the same objective that the United States had in mind. When Rumsfeld vetoed the agreement that Karzai made with the Taliban leadership on December 6, 2001, <clears throat> it's not because he had a different strategy for achieving peace in Afghanistan. It's because achieving peace in Afghanistan was not the reason that the U.S. went into Afghanistan. It was to punish the terrorists and those who harbored them. And they didn't even think about peace in Afghanistan. So, just, this, this is, that, so that's one thing. Now, uh, as far as what is going on in Afghanistan, one thing that's happening in Afghanistan is that the past 40 years have seen a tremendous rise in political and military mobilization by all sectors of the population. Uh, and a, a buildup of state structures, ineffective as they are. And what we can see as a result of that is what we have seen in so many other countries in the world and what you would expect a rise in political competition among identity groups. Mm. And in fact, recently one case is the government is issuing uh, electronic IDs. For the first time, there will be uh, a, an, an official manner in which every citizen is connected to the state. And because of that, they have to put some words on it to say what it is. And they cannot agree on the word Afghan, because the word Afghan is ambiguous. And sometimes that ambiguity is good. But now, because it can no longer be ambiguous because of this mobilization and state formation. And it's creating huge conflicts about what, you know, what, about identity. They want identity. to put the ethnicity on the cards. This is where the conflict is. They no, want to put the conflict the is the word Afghan. No. No. Okay. Uh, so what I will say is, if uh, we, we have no reason to believe, we can't ask the question, how will Afghanistan be stable? We don't know if that it will yeah. be. But... If it does, this is my hypothesis about the one way it might work. It would be a systemic change in the region, not something in Afghanistan. Southeast Asia, 40, 50 years ago, was not in such a better condition that Southwest and Central Asia is in now. What happened there? Did they find indigenous political solutions to all those countries? No. What happened is that China, Chinese and Japanese economies expanded, the range of opportunities expanded, and it just all those other things became relatively less important. Okay. That is what could happen over a course of decades in this region. Good. Uh, I'm being asked to wrap up. So one word, 2025, Afghanistan better or worse? No, I, I, the whole point of my last <laughs> remark was that <laughs> there's, Let me see. the worst per, I'll say this. The worst person to ask about that is an expert in Afghanistan. That's true. Because what will happen between now and 2025 to Afghanistan does not depend on Afghanistan. I think, I think probably uh, nothing can be predicted. You say two times. 2025, we don't know what's going to happen till 2020. Okay. So I think probably is a, you know, is a uh, changing situation as ever in Afghanistan. Kathy, make a prediction. Come on. No, I, I learned a long time ago not to predict on Afghanistan. I also learned a long time ago there are no experts on Afghanistan. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... I hope this one has uh, woken up anybody who's getting tired after lunch. Um, the one thing you learn in the policy field, and <coughs> this question was deliberate, is that we are brilliant at telling you about all the problems. Don't ask us about solutions. That's a tough one. Uh, let me just end by saying two things, if I may. Uh, one, you know, there was conversation here, U.S.-Pakistan, there, there were questions. Um, I will say, as a Pakistani sitting in Washington for a number of years, in the middle of the policy space, um, We've gotten to a point where the U.S. and Pakistan mistrust, the level of mistrust is so deep that both sides are almost drawing sadistic pleasure out of pointing a finger at the other. And the only thing I want to put on the table for everybody is, 
we can go back and have another hour's conversation. No policymaker has ever been able to give me a solution to Afghanistan in which Pakistan and the U.S. don't work together. So we have to be careful in where we end up, but that relationship at the end of the day remains crucial not only for Afghanistan, Pakistan, but, but the whole region. The, the last thing I'll say is let's leave by keeping in mind that what we've talked about here is essentially interstate politics. We've talked about competing interests. We've talked about countries not getting along and blaming each other. At the end of the day, the tragedy of the region is, a region is that it's the individual humans and the citizens of that region that continue to suffer. So in the hope that we actually get to a point where we can make it stable for the average common Afghan, Pakistani, and everybody else, uh, let's thank our panelists for being here.